Oh, there it is. Okay. So let me know when we're live. We're live now. Good evening, everyone. And tonight is the second in the three-part series in regard to the history of uh, rabbinical Judaism. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to go th from the Reformation period around the late 1500s or the end of the 16th century to 1900s, just before the beginning of the 20th century. So tonight we're going to talk about um, what I refer to as uh, three regions, one Judaism. So once, as we talked about last week, once Jewish people had been spread out between the Mediterranean, places like Spain, and then into uh, Europe and Eastern Europe towards Russia, they settled in as communities. So when we talked about, at the end of last week, we were talking about um, the setting up of ghettos, the, the term ghetto, which is found in Venice around 1537. And these setups create two things. One, uh, a concentration of culture and of course families. And also, depending on where the individuals were located, whether they were in Spain, under the Moors in Islam, or whether they were in Eastern Europe um, on, amongst the principalities of what was then the czars and the old princes, as well as what was going on in the early parts of, uh, of Germany and Saxony where um, the Lutheran religion started to be formed or Protestantism or, uh, or the Reformation had started. All three of these set a precedent of how each Jewish community acts and how it acts differently and how it also held together. So a couple of things I need to explain. And for those of you online, um, please wait until after my lecture. If you uh, want to write down a question, then do so. Or uh, Emily, who's going to be hosting and managing this, if you, you can message her and either she or Carrie will read those questions at the end so nobody forgets to ask their question. So we begin and, and I'm beginning in Germany for a very specific reason. Up until um, 1517, it was only two major religions, three if we count the Eastern European into the, so, into the, into the Russian Empire and the Polish Empire. You have the Roman Catholic Church, which is centered for now, because at, at one point, it gets split off between France and Italy. Now it has returned to the Vatican fully. So you have the Roman Catholic Church, you have in the East, the Russian Orthodox Christian Church, and in, the, and in Spain and the surrounding Mediterranean area, you have some Christians, but mostly what we refer to as Moors. Those are Sufi Muslims, not Shia Muslims. And it's gonna be important to know why that's important once we get to meet up with Maimonides. So, we're going to start with Germany first, because this is where something radically changes. Everyone knows the story of Martin Luther hanging the 95 theses on the Wittenberg door. The concept here was Luther's position was that the ambiance, the, the uh, money transactionary level between his religion, between Christianity and the personal aspect of Christianity was somehow separated. You can be rich, do all these terrible things, says, says Luther in his writings, and you can throw some coins in and you have your indulgence and now you're, you, you get to go, you get to go to heaven, right? So Luther's position now wants, and remember, this is not, it wasn't called Lutheranism. It was called Reformation. Luther's intent was never to leave the Catholic Church but to reform it. So what transpires is something very interesting. Uh, some of the German princes who were looking at the possibility that they could stand apart from the very Italian, very Vatican church and keep that money for themselves. That church money would now be in the, in the coffers of these princes. 
who eventually come together as what we now know as Germany later on into the early 18th, uh, 1900, uh, uh, 18th to the 20th century. So this allows Luther to A, be protected from uh, being basically excommunicated and killed by the, uh, by the Vatican. And also it allows him to consolidate his idea of what this reformation is supposed to look like. So one of the first things he does is he takes, because up until this point, the Roman Catholic Church said, you can't read your Bible because you're not a priest. We, the priests, will be able to translate this for you because if you if you start to read it on your own, you're gonna you'll fall into heresies because you're not you're not you know trained professionally as a priest. And that belief system happens until 1964 with the Vatican II Council. But I digress. So what Luther does, and this is what's critically important because it sets a precedent for Judaism. Luther decides that he's going to democratize. And remember, I used that word before when I was talking about the Torah, about the five books of Moses. By writing it down and giving it to the people and training the people, the people have internalized or democratized, that's my word, belief system. And this is how we get the synagogue system that we talked about last week. He decides to translate Greek and Latin texts, mostly Latin, into German, common German. He first tackles the Christian scriptures, so the Gospels and the writings all found in the New Testament. And when he translates it and then he distributes it to many of the staunch Catholic Germans, many of them read this Bible, have more questions, and eventually come to Luther's aid and become Lutherans. So after that experience, he thought this is fantastic. I've saved, you know, I've now now have caused the German people to reform themselves and be holding to the Christian church I, because they've read the scriptures in their own language. So Luther decides to go one step farther and then decides he's going to translate the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures into this common German. And he believes that once he does that, the Jewish population will go, oh my goodness, I wish I, I, wish I could have read this in, in German uh, as opposed to Hebrew, which I already know how to read. And believes that by him, by them, by the average Germ German Jew reading it, that they would convert to Christianity. So he does this, he translates the Old Testament into German, hands it to the Jewish community and goes, yeah, well, yeah. Actually, and some some of the uh, authorities say, well, you translated some of these words incorrectly from Hebrew, or you, you could have used something else. This angers and frustrates um, Luther till in 1537, later in his life, he feels so betrayed that his plan would not work, did not work like it did with the German Christians and the German Roman Catholics who became Lutheran, that he begins to write a book. And that book, I'll read it. Uh, I'm just gonna give you the German title first. Uh, it's Von den Juden, Juden und Irin Löwen. In other words, uh, translated the Jews and their lies. I have a quote, and that quote is found in two places, this particular book, and in the preface of Mein Kampf, because Adolf Hitler indicated that, and I quote in his preface, that if it wasn't for Martin Luther, he would not know how to create the book that is translated My Struggle, Mein Kampf, and that his struggle was due to the fact, not because of economics, not because of anything that the German people did, but because of the Jews. And this, this book particularly starts to create a anti-Semitic trope that we go all the way to this day. And it is unfortunate. Luther's 
and I've and I've spoken to and and many and many biographers of Luther try to tiptoe around it because his original intent when he writes in his in his diary was that he was going to save the world by handing everyone the gospel. As he got older, and he was a man who did not like to make a mistake or be told that he was wrong, it became a festering situation. And that festering situation becomes this book and it becomes, it gets translated in over 30 different languages from as far away as Spain and as far east as Russia. And we get to see other things like that appear, other versions of that appear um, in, in different forms. So I don't want to dwell on this, but it does set a precedent where the German, where German Jews are now even seen not only as not understanding Christianity, but that they are belligerently against it. And this is a slow transition over 1500 years from where Nero was angry at Roman Christians for supporting the first uh, Roman Jewish war in Israel around 70 of the Common Era. And when you get to Constantine, Constantine's position is, I'm gonna create a religious state and I want to eliminate any kind of, of opposition that includes anybody who's a heretic or, or heterodox from my orthodox view. And the other plan was to eliminate Jewry because they have a historical model that predates it. And this is now, I wouldn't say the final action, but what does transpire is that before this book, before the circumstance, there were open discussions in Europe between Jews and Christians, debates, discussions, that after this book is written in 1737, uh, 1537 ends, Christians are trying to convert Jews, but now Jews are no longer having a conversation back. They're standing silent. And that silence, unfortunately, comes to its head in 1939. But we'll get back to that. So I don't want to dwell on it. You can look at the quotes. Um, it's unfortunate. And unfortunately, it is, in Luther's case, an act of, of anger and uh, just being a cranky old man. And unfortunately, that cranky old man, you know, sparked somebody over 300 years later to, to do much worse than what he had just said. So I'm going to stop there with that. Um, so now this brings us, so this is what's happening to European Jewry. European Jewry is either being inculcated in, in now Catholic countries, as we talked about last week, between, you know, uh, I want to loan money to, you know, Giuseppe, but I, he's a Catholic, I, I can't charge him interest. So I'm going to go to the Jewish guy, the Jewish guy is going to lend him money at interest, and I'm going to take some of that money out. And that's the way the system worked there. It also works the same way in Spain under the Muslims. So in Spain, what's going on is we're gonna to get to Maimonides in a minute, but what happens is Sufi Islam versus Shia Islam is as different as day and night. Sufi Muslims at this time, before the uh, routing by, the, by, by uh, Ferdinand and Isabella in 1489 uh, to 1491, at this point in time, the Sufis were great warriors and tacticians. They were also intellectuals. They translated when, when, um, when, uh, when early Roman Christians and Greek Christians lit the Library of Alexandria on fire, around 250 of the Common Era, much of the knowledge that we have about Plato, Aristotle, the Ptolemy, Ptolemy uh, and all the Greek philosophers were lost to Western uh, eyes. The ones that did have it were the Muslims. They had, they had found parchments and books in Egypt in what, what, uh, what uh, during, the, um, during the Alexandrian, Alexandrian Empire period of Hellenism, we have folks like um, 
uh, I can't remember his name now suddenly, but uh, basically the the Roman the Greek Empire in Egypt doing still storing many of these books in part or in whole. Once the Muslims, once Islam takes over that area, instead of destroying them as heresy, the Sufis collected them and translated them, translated them into Aramaic, which most Jews at the time could read. And, and Aramaic versus any other uh, language is actually easier to translate into either what is Yiddish or Ladino, which is the Spanish version of the common language of the Jewish people, as well as them translating it into Italian, Latin, German, and so forth. So when we get to this point where these Sufi Muslims are collecting, copying, and discussing Greek philosophy, you, you also have a Jewish contingent which has the freedom to have these discussions and these debates. And one of those folks is Moses Maimonides. And Moses Maimonides went one step further. He collected many of the ideas, both from the Talmud that is now kind of growing because now people are writing comments around the comments. That's why they become exponentially bigger. But more importantly, what happens is he starts to apply both Western Greek Hellenist ideas and saying whether it's valid or not within Jewish and more Eastern concepts of what we understand as the law of the mitzvahs. This culminates in a book called the Mishnah Torah, which is a book of ethics where he discusses both Western and Eastern ideas of how we treat property, how we treat our neighbor, what does that mean? What is a fair example of, you know, if, if you know, God forbid, uh, one of your workmen fall into a pit and, you know, breaks his skull or loses an eye, how, how, do, we, how do we ethically make sure that this is right and good and, and fair? And that is the basis of Maimonides' argument to the point where a secondary book he wrote, The Guide to the Perplexed, is a commentary on all the difficult stuff. A lot of the, a lot of the mitzvahs, a lot of the commandments that are found in the Torah are talking about the, the red heifer, um, you know, uh, the temple, uh, how, how, you know, certain situations which were very vague uh, in the uh, arguments within the Talmud, he addresses a lot. And so, he sets, a te he sets a precedent. Now I have to stop for a second and point something out. A lot of people, when they see ultra-Orthodox Jews, particularly Hasidim, and we'll get to the Hasids in a minute, we see a very spiritual, very like esoteric aspect of Judaism. Technically speaking, that doesn't exist until about the 1700s, late, late 1600s. Jews, for the most part, whether with the Muslims in the east, uh, in, in the, uh, I'm sorry, in Spain and into, and into the Mediterranean area there, into Egypt, as well as in, in Germany and the surrounding areas like Italy, France, and so forth, are ethicists. They see who they are as Jews on an ethical ground. And also, what we find as well is, well, you know, the first temple got destroyed and we get to go back in 70 years. The second temple gets destroyed and now it's 1600 years later. The question everyone's asking is, what happens to us? And this is where, and I'm, this is my turn. I'm sure other rabbis and other scholars will use other terms, but this is my turn. The concept of spiritual Israel, that as a community, as long as we're together, as a family, as a, as a synagogue, as a community, as a ghetto, it's Israel, wherever we are. The idea of returning to the land doesn't really start to spark 
until we get way into the into the 1800s, into the late 1800s, late 19th century. So most rabbinical Jews, when you say, where's Israel, they'll go like this. They're not thinking an isthmus in the Mediterranean. And in fact, at one point, uh, the last czar of the Russias, of Russia, uh, tried to give a portion of, I forgot what the country was, but it's within his province to create a Jewish nation. And we were, and we were, and people were thinking about doing it. So until much, much later in this discussion where we're having, the idea of going back to the nation of Israel to be a nation is on is not thought about as deeply as it's going to be thought about in a few in a few minutes. So there's a lot of discussions about Moses Maimonides. Maimonides is also known as the Ram, Rambam. So it's it's a it means Rabbi Moshe ben Me, um, Maman, meaning the father of Ma Moses, son of Mammon. So that's how we get Rambam, as my father would say. We were in Brooklyn. It's Rambam, but you know, uh, but the Rambam, uh, a lot of a lot of historical biographers of Rambam. Rambam believe that he most likely may have been an atheist, but truly, an, but truly an ethicist. Now, people will argue back and forth, back and forth. He was considered, you know, the most important est ethicist ever, but his position was always from a position of, well, it's nice that God is where he's at, but we need to apply this. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. And as my rabbi, a blessed memory, Rabbi Sadden used to say, and I'm going to repeat it because it makes sense, says God doesn't need you to believe in him. God exists beyond you. What's important is that you see what God has given us and apply it. And that is Moses Maimonides in a nutshell. His position wasn't, you know, trying to find, you know, the spiritual connection, the, the, um, you know, the fancifulness, the almost evangelical fervor, that wasn't Jewish thought at that time. So it's interesting to note because when people try to find the aspects of how to apply as Jewish people, how to do right, good, and justice, they're not looking at the Zohar or Kabbalism. They're, they're looking at the Rambam. And the reason is because he's no, he's plain spoken. In fact, there's one earlier uh, rabbi, Rabbi Rashi, who is 300 years earlier, and he quotes Rashi. And Rashi, we also have commentaries. If you if you ever look in a, um, I should have brought it, uh, a, a Jewish Hebrew scriptures, it'll say Rashi said, you know, when you see something and you're like, what is that? And then you look down, they'll say Rashi says, this is what it was, or this is how it is. And it, there's no, you know, there's no spiritual, whoo, it's like, this is what the Hebrew word says, move on. So between Rashi and Rambam, we get, we get the, the, the core of what rabbinical Judaism is until, until we get to 1698, actually 1720, actually. And so we, so we're, so, um, so in the so in Germany we're getting this situation where now the Protestant Reformation is evangelizing, and because Jewish people are either arguing back, or and and there's violence to that, so that that language is stopped. That's in that's in Europe now. In Spain, stuff is still going on, but when the Sufis lose out to the Shiites. The Shiites, didn't, they're the ones that burned all the books because they thought it, if it's not the Quran, it must be destroyed. Very Constant-esque comparatively. And fortunately, most of those books that were copied in Aramaic were written by, were, were, were taken by those Jews running away. 
So, and what happened, what transpires is that she is, the, the Shiites were able to out destroy, destroy the Sufis, even though they were great warriors, but the Spanish Catholics decimated the Sufis. And that's how we get Ferdinand and Isabella. And that's why suddenly in 1491 to 1492, Columbus sails the, the ocean blue. So, that's due to the fact that the Shias, the Shiites basically undermine their own for political reasons. So that's, what's, so that's what's happening in Spain. Now we move towards the East, towards Poland, Hungary, uh, and, and most of what would be now considered the Russian, you know, the, the, the Russian borders. And we get to a guy in the 1700s by the name of the Baal Shem Tov. Actually, that's his nickname. His real name is Israel ben Eliezer. And one side note is during the time Maimonides was in Spain, in Cordova, um, there was a spiritual practice that was being picked up. Islam under the Sufis were doing a lot of mysticism, a lot of uh, transcendental meditation for lack of a better term. And what came out of it was two books, the Zohar and Kabbalism. Basically, it was the it was the Judaization, if that's a word, if I could use that word, of Islamic and Near Eastern um, meditation and internal spiritual action. It didn't catch on like it does when it gets to the hands of the Baal folk. The Baal Shem Tov um, brings about what we call Hasidism. The idea, and, and, a, and a few things that the Baal Shem Tov does that no other Jewish people of authority do, is he pulls out from that mystical um, action that it should be connected to um, as a, a, an emotional connection to our practice, our observance, which was now, which was up until this point, a much more focused, much more law focused ethical practice. You know, there, there should be compassion, but not, you know, basically speaking in tongues with Jews. It's kind of scary. But what transpires is he does something, Baal Shem Tov does something that nobody else has done up until this point. He connects the spiritual aspects from it, but he also does a few other things. Up until this point, the idea, now the word Messiah in English is from a Hebrew word called Mashiach, which is the person, which is found in Isaiah chapter 45 in regard to uh, King Cyrus. It literally means, Moshiach literally means oil being poured over your head. Basically, you're the king, have a nice day. It's not Messiah in that, in that Christian Eastern, uh, uh, Western concept. That very Greek and Roman idea of a God king is not understood by Eastern Jewish tradition. And also the text doesn't bear that out because of the word. Mashiach literally means to pour something, usually oil. Um, so Mashiach is somebody you, you pour oil on somebody. They're anointed for a purpose. Baal Shem Tov says that there now takes on part of this mysticism and says that this Mashiach is not just a spirit in which we are all part of, okay, but it's somebody. And now, almost 1,800 years later, we're now starting to take on the, yeah, we're waiting for Messiah too, in front of Christians, in front of Muslims. And that sets a precedent that eventually will start to uh, become uh, much clearer when we get to week three next week. So we have these three situations in the far east, I'm sorry, in the, in the far eastern European area, you've got these folks 
who are alone. They're, they're, in, a, they're in a very harsh condition. Winters are very long. Uh, it sounds familiar, right? Um, here in, in central New York. Um, but th they're, they're trying to find purpose you know, in the face of hardship, a great hardship. Whereas folks in Spain with Maimonides, folks in Germany are, and Italy and so forth, are making a living and they're interacting with the non-Jewish community, but nothing terrible is going on. There's anti-Semitism, anti yes. Uh, is there, do they, do people when, when the banks fail in France, and in Spain, I'm sorry, in France and in um, Italy, uh, you know, there are terrible murders of Jews, but they then suddenly realize that they can't take out loans and then the cycle starts again. And that's history. I, it sounds incredibly coy, but it is what it is. So what transpires next is while this is happening, the, the Reformation, um, the, the, the discovery of, the United, of, of, of America, not the United States, but North America, uh, and um, also the Reformation, something rises up from that. When we get into the 18th century, into the 1700s, there's a new movement, an intellectual movement, a, a renaissance of intellectualism. People are now translating those same documents of Aristotle and Plato, and math and science, and they're trying to find out the natural world, the enlightenment comes in. And the enlightenment brings about two things. One, the idea that we can understand everything by observing it. And later on, we see that the only way we're going to better the world together is by, we all, by us all observing it and seeing what's true and what's not. Now, by the 18th century, we have philosophers like Locke, Kant, and a gentleman from Britain named John Toland. John Toland does something, and a lot of people have never read his book. I, I, I believe I have a copy of it, and I have read it. Toland creates a pamphlet, a treatise. And one of the problems that the British Empire has in, uh, I'm trying to see what year, I think it was 18, yeah, it was 1860. So one of the things that were going on is that the British Empire is now the main empire. Now they're having problems with the Catholics in Ireland, and so forth, and they're having, and they don't know what to do with the Jews, and they, you know, and they are now in India, and they're now in everywhere else, and. Poland says, wait a minute, we're, we're going about this all wrong. We need to apply what Locke and Kant had applied. Let's observe, let's teach, let's educate. So he writes this pamphlet called The Reasons for Naturalizing the Jews in Great Britain and Ireland. Now that second part is not only the Jews, but the Catholics in Ireland. That's how the pamphlet really lays out. So what happens is his position is, look, let's apply what we know, what we teach in university. Let's observe together the natural world and let them figure it out for themselves. Let them unhook themselves from their you know, uh, superstitions and, and bring them to the greater good of Protestant British superiority is basically, I'm translating. But that's what he does. And it, and it does bring about a renaissance allowing Jews to study, uh, not just in Britain, but we start to see this in Germany, in Hungary, in parts of uh, Russia, uh, in Poland, not as much, but mostly in Germany, France, and England. So we get guys like Albert Einstein um, and, uh, and, and many other and, and scientists coming out from this. So in a way it does, but to Toland's dismay, it doesn't stop Jews from being Jews. And, and, uh, and, and, that, is, and, and that is the problem. And he got, it's like, how come we can't fix that? So by the end of the, uh, by the end of the 18th century, I'm sorry, 19th century, we start to see 
the rise of anti-Semitism in different ways. And this brings us to somebody who, if you don't know, is probably one of the most important Jewish people of the time, and that would be Theodor Herzl. Theodor Herzl uh, is a journalist and a writer. He is an atheist and he is not a religious Jew. He's Jewish by birth and that's it. But he goes and as a reporter, as a French report, uh, journalist, he goes to a trial called the Dreyfus Affair, if anybody remembers that, where they blame uh, a Jewish guy um, for a crime that he didn't commit. And in fact, they send him to Devil's Island and it, it takes about 10 years for the actual conspirators who did the deed to admit it. And by that time they get pardoned and he gets sent home with no pension, even though he has been a, ro a lo loyal you know, French soldier for, you know, fight, he fought in the, Napole the Napoleonic Wars and got wounded and was decorated, well decorated. And while Herschel is watching this nightmare happen and writing about it, he decides to start to talk out loud about a Jewish state. He comes to the conclusion that spiritual Jewry, spiritual Ju Judaism is fine and well until somebody puts a gun to your head, I'm translating. And his position is not that we should go to Palestine, but we need to have our own nation. We need to have our own country. We have to figure it out. In fact, he was looking in Brazil and in South America. It was more or less just an, uh, it's just more or less a, an intellectual discussion. Um, he did try to organize folks, but did it half part of it. But he is the one that suddenly turns around and says, no, the only way a Jewish person is going to be truly protected is if he has a gun and he has, and he has a line in the sand where it says, this is mine and you're over there. You can visit me, but if you, if you try to violate, violate my, my rights and my, and my personage because of my religion or because of who I am as a, as a race, this is the only way we can fix the problem. And this is where Zionism starts from its point. And at the same time, we have the writers of Marx and Engel and the Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. And this now links together into what we call social Zionism. And that is where some of them go to Paraguay, or Uruguay, sorry, Uruguay, and some of them go to Palestine, British Palestine. And the Brits are like, great, you want, get out of my country, go over there. And they were cool with it uh, until they started uh, suicide bombing, but that's next week. So at the same time, with all this going from spiritual Jewry to physical, let's get, let's get the, the Zionist movement going. At the same time in the United States, um, we have, we have um, Rabbi Weiss, Wise, he was originally Weiss, he changed it as Wise, sound more American. And in 1900, he decided that the best way to reform Judaism is to make it look more like an American church. And Reform Judaism starts out with him basically talking about we need to throw off all this old stuff that makes us look like Jews, obviously. We need to be Americans. And so a lot of a lot of the so when you walk into, if you've ever walked into a Orthodox Jewish synagogue, it looks very it looks like it was there since the eleven hundreds. And you know, you've got these guys with these big palaces, these big prayer shawls over their heads and everything else. You go into a reform synagogue and it looks it looks like a church, except without a cross. There is the Torah scroll that I showed you last week, uh, but he made reforms like, you know, you don't have to wear tassels, you know, uh, you don't have to wear a yarmulke. Uh, you can dress any way you want. Those laws with, you know, wool and, and linen, that those are, those are from way back. We're modern American people. And it does set it up where we get um, this first reform movement and this first reform movement, uh, there was no orthodox conservative reform reconstructionist. You were a Jew. And as my father used to say, there are two kinds of Jews, good Jews and bad Jews. And the good Jews go to shul on Saturday, eat kosher and, you know, do what they're supposed to do. And the bad Jews, well, they, they shave. And they, they take the train to synagogue and then they go watch a baseball game afterward. That's a bad Jew. And that's really what was. It, no one ever said, oh, you orthodox or you conservative reform. But the reform movement 
caught on. But what transpired was the reform movement became more socially, socially involved, politically involved. And the majority of Jews, especially when they get here from Eastern Europe and from, uh, and from, and from basically mostly Europe, Eastern Europe and uh, Germany, like my grandfather came. My grandfather was for all intents and purposes, a reformed Jew, even though he didn't call himself that, you know, clean shaven and all that good stuff. But what causes it to be reform and orthodox is when Weiss started saying, hey, you don't have to keep kosher. That was the final nope. And then, and then the Orthodox Union was created. So this is where we get to the bottom here. So at this point in 1900, we're at a cusp. Two groups of people. One group wants to hold on to their belief system and their practices. And the other wants to reform but hold on to the social ideas of what it means to be Jewish. And we're going to start to see that development even more when we get into the 60s and today. All right. So this ends uh, the my my lecture today. Does anybody have any questions? And if you do, uh, please just give me one minute. I will be right back. I just need to grab something. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, so does uh, does anybody have any questions online? And I'll ask the audience here. There weren't any questions in the comments. Okay. Anyone have any questions? I'm looking at you, Isaac. Anyone? Anyone? I could have covered everything. All right. How about you, Howie? You have any questions? <laughs> right, that's it. See what happens when I study? That's terrible. Wait a minute. Yeah. Well, um, so or no. Oh, my dog, and I also got into 45 minutes. Um, so just uh just a couple of um, I, I did want to. I did want to mention something that I, for the recording and for the audience, um, somebody wanted. To, somebody had asked me. I was having a conversation about doing this lecture, and I was trying to figure out how to approach it. And somebody asked me if a friend of mine, um, who's not Jewish, and said, "How do you describe, um, you know, the difference between Christianity and Judaism?" and how, how each one works. And the example I gave, and I've been, I've, been, I've been struggling on how to give this example. I thought it was a good example at three o'clock this morning, but let's give it a shot. So let's imagine religion as a vehicle, as a car. Let's say you, you, you're, you're driving this car and also you have to understand when you're, when you're driving this vehicle, um, you feel the way you feel inside the vehicle. 
And folks who see you drive by in that vehicle, that, that belief system, will either love the vehicle, hate the vehicle, or go, eh. And that's regardless of whether you're a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, whatever. You're using this vehicle. And it's interesting to note because I've had conversations with pastors. And they say to me, does Judaism have faith? A faith. And that's an unfair question to ask. And I'll explain why. The concept of faith, uh, there's an old Jew, there's an old Yiddish joke, uh, you know, uh, you know what, you know what, uh, you know, trust me means in Yiddish, we're all screwed. So this is the position. I know that's old. Anyway, so the difference between having faith and being an observant person, being somebody who's, who's observant, we don't use the word faith. We don't trust somebody just telling us to do something. In fact, the five books of Moses say, you do this, you'll live a long life. You don't do this, you're not going to live very long. And the idea that the consequences of those actions are immediate and during your life. So we don't have a payoff in the end. So the difference between faith and observance is if somebody gets in the into the vehicle and they base it on faith. They start the car, they start the vehicle, they drive the vehicle. If lights go on and off, they ignore it until it doesn't work for them anymore. And they get out and they're confused, wondering why it doesn't work. And then they either try someone to give them another vehicle, go to another religion, or they try to have somebody try to fix it for them, but they don't learn what was going on that caused them for their vehicle to stop working for them. In Judaism, observance works this way. You start the car, you, you check the oil, you, you make sure the battery is good, you make sure there's enough gas. And if anything goes wrong, you take it to an expert and then the expert tells you what, it, what was wrong, what you need to do. And then you hopefully, if you're a good Jew, hopefully you learn from that experience and then before you know it, you're fixing your own vehicle. It becomes internalized. And that's the difference between having faith and being observant. You can decide, you know, I'm, don't get me wrong. I know a lot of Jews who just said, I'm done. There's a famous rapper, Matthew Yahoo, Matthew Miller, who was incredibly, he was very trusting of the Hasidic movement. Um, but they, he had a, he had a crisis and they didn't support him. They didn't show him what was going on. So it happens everywhere. Don't, there, there's no, this is not a perfect scenario, but that's the difference. Why, why, why religious Jews, I hate using that term because even other rabbis go blah, because they don't like to use that word because religious is, is not a term. Observant, if you're, if you're, if you're, and it's not even where, you know, you, you try to know what you believe. And, Fortunately or unfortunately, if we go back to Luther, Luther figures, you know, these Christians were, were ignorant. I showed them what the, I showed them that, you know, they could read this and they, oh my gosh. And then they, he had made the same assumption of, a, a kind of you know, a, a religion that is literal, literary. So, and that was his shortcoming. He could have addressed it a different way. I think that it's unfortunate that what he what he decided to do after that also shut down conversations between Jews and Christians for five, six hundred years until the Holocaust. Literally, that's the moment that Jews suddenly started having conversations. And that's unfortunate. And that, and as I said last week, as I'm going to say today and probably next week is. All this belief system stuff does not come from a, is not coming out of a vacuum. So our interactions lack thereof, communications lack thereof, our interactions both financially, um, spiritually, and also uh, you know just civilly between us. The example with the drivers' affair is, is a terrible uh, you know uh, miscarriage of justice. 
And under the circumstances, you know, Dreyfus should have been, you know, at least apologized to. They just they didn't even return his pension. And then they forgave these folks for doing this horrible thing after, you know, basically almost, he almost lost his life in Devil's Island because it's a terrible place full of malaria. But this is what goes on. And ultimately these lectures that I'm doing is to deepen the conversation more, to allow a conversation between everyone, both directions. Jews do not want to convert other people to Judaism. That is the last thing anybody wants to do, especially me. Because we believe, as you and I had spoken now, how he, uh, uh, about the seven laws of Noah, you can live a full life and you could continue to be, you know, Methodist, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, Pentecostal. And if you live a good life from the position of, of a Jewish person, continue to do so. You're not going to, you're not going to be in a better place than me. We're both going to end up at the same spot. We're going to be, you know, and hopefully we've left families, family, friends, people that we've, you know, interacted with and helped to remember, you know, to do what we what we hope that we could do fully. So, and that's the ultimate goal of every Jewish person. And hopefully, I, my hope is that every every person should do that way. So, all right. The reason, no, go go ahead. The reason why right. Different covenants, right? But then there's the question are there other covenants out there? There you go. And Maimonides would tell you, maybe. 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 I, I get it. I get it good because I talk about heaven, mm -hmm. city. Right. And, and the Jewish neighborhood was right. there first. Right. And I think there's a difference. No, I thought, you were, I thought you were referring to Florida. But, uh, <laughs> no, heaven. <laughs> When you said heaven, I was thinking Book of Tone. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't, I don't know that yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I, the, the issue here is that, you know, our, uh, uh, from the Jewish perspective, the goal is to make sure that the people you leave behind continue to do better than what you were doing. Because, you know, you screw up. You know, we all screw up. And we try to not screw up as much, but then we're hoping that, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like if you go to a shop class, and the shop teacher is like holding like, perfect, don't do this, you know, check, check your equipment before you, you know, you, you're hoping that your students are going to keep all their fingers. And that's really what the goal is. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because, um, uh, uh, partially because uh, I've always had, um, particularly in New York City, we, we, we would uh, interact with a lot of evangelicals, Jehovah's Witnesses, they would come knocking at the door and, and all that good stuff. And I would start having a conversation with them. And then after a while, they either tried to leave or they're just staring at me until I stopped you know, talking to them and then I closed the door. And that's unfortunate because in a way, I don't want to challenge somebody else's belief system, whether you call it faith or not. And, the, the, and, and that is not the goal never is never will be you know but at the same time that threat that you know maybe what i believe may not be quite right is what you know what we see with luther and unfortunately what we see when we get to world war ii and it's it's very scary it's very dangerous but that is that is the discussion that we'll probably finish up next week. Uh, does anybody else have any other comments or questions? Oh, oops, I, thought, I, thought. I can't believe I'm on time. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. All right, so next week we're going to discuss uh, basically from 1901, which begins the 20th. 20th century till the present. Uh, I will be discussing um, the development of Reform Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, 
modern orthodoxy, reform, uh, reconstructionist, and also um, the relationships between the state of Israel uh, first as a socialist uh, government and also how we how religious Jews interact with this secular state. All right. So uh, hopefully we'll join each other next week for the final installment. Um, thank you very much for your time and we'll see each other next week.